everybody, JD here, and it is April 29th, maybe? I don't know. It's all the same COVID uh, quarantine groundhog day. But uh, anyway, it is uh, Wednesday night. Thanks for uh, tuning in. We've uh, changed the night, as you know. Uh, thinking there was on Fridays, at some point, um, people are going to actually be doing fun things again, instead of being sitting at home on Friday night. So I would change it to Wednesdays just so, you know, night that people are normally home. So anyway, uh, by the way, please uh, subscribe right down here. That helps. That that helps my, um, I don't know. I don't know what it helps, but just hit the button, <laughs> the red button. And uh, if you're on Facebook anyway. And we got a cool show tonight. We're going to be top water, top water, top water. And I had to put the Delta in the background because... That uh, just reminds me of the magic hour, that last half hour of the evening or the first half hour of the morning when uh, the shadows are long and the stripers are strong on the surface. So um, we'll be talking to Tom Amberson of HK Slays Media, who is a top water fanatic like myself. And we'll get into all kinds of how to stuff and uh, get you pumped up for top water. Uh, it's going on right now if you're fishing like in the. Uh, NorCal region on the Delta and the rivers for striped bass anyway, and of course, largemouth as well. Um, what else? Uh, we moved the night. We got that. And uh, what have I been doing is the uh, question I got just now. I have been uh, still not guiding. Um, been sitting around watching the paint dry, the grass grow, uh, trying to do some yard projects and going a little bit crazy, I must say. But I have been getting out on the lake. Uh, of course, I live up here in Tahoe now. And uh, the boat ramps are still closed. The beaches are closed. It's hard to get to the water. But I found a little sneaky way. And I have my 10-foot little John boat. And I've been out trolling around and catching a few fish. And let's see if I can show you one. This was my. This was a couple days ago. Nice big old brown. That was fun. Caught and released him. And... Uh, um, getting not a lot of bites right now, but getting a few in the mornings. I just go out for, oh, you know, an hour, two, two and a half in the morning just to, just to get out to do it and uh, kind of keep my sanity. So anyway, that's what I've been up to. And hopefully one of these days I'll get back to guiding. Um, up here, they're talking maybe July one to get, uh, get the ramps and kind of the stay in place, uh, shelter in place thing lifted. So we shall see. But uh, anyway, thanks again for joining us. And again, we're going to be here on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. from now on until proven otherwise. I don't know. See if uh, see if it works better. But um, so top water night, which leads me to the tip of the week and uh, sponsored by nobody, by the way. But since we are uh, Top water, uh, talking top water tonight. I thought I'd give you a couple tips on uh, rigging top water plugs for striped bass, which is one of my favorite things to do. So I've got a plug here. And one of the things that I like to do, real simple, and I, I, I pulled this from my, my salmon fishing uh, with plugs days, and it is, let me get it up here so you can see it. Ooh, that's a little funky. Uh, you can see right here and right here, I've got double split rings on there. And the reason I put double split rings on these plugs, because obviously they normally come with a split ring and then down to your, your hook, right? So I just add a second one in there. It's cheap. Buy good ones. Don't buy cheap ones. But it's in an expensive process. And what happens is when a fish bites that and he's fighting, he can twist all over the joint. And that thing twists with him. So he's not able to rip that out of his mouth. You know what I mean? So um, that helps keep fish on a lot better than just one split ring. And again, I borrowed that from my old, you know, quick fishing days for salmon. Now, um, the other thing I do is typically, not all the time, but most of the time, um, I don't know if you can see it. Nah, not really. But I clip the uh, the barbs off the hooks. And I've had a lot of people go, well, you know, guys get in the boat and they'll look at the plug and like, hey, this thing's barbless, man. What's up with that? You're trying to be a member of Greenpeace or something? <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. What? What happens a lot when you get into a hot striper bite is you get a lot of this. Let's see if we can make that. Yep. So you get that happening. Like you get a fish that takes it down deep and especially a big fish like this. I don't want to kill it. You know, the, the rule on my boat in the Sacramento Valley is you know, about 
eight pounds and up goes back into the water because those are typically hens. So you get a fish like this with barbed hooks, there's no way she's surviving. So by going barbless, I ensure that fish is going to make it, which is, uh, which is a cool thing. Um, also, I've had many occasions where uh, the worst one was I had some guys fishing and we had four or five guys in the boat and we all had big striper topwater plugs like this with giant hooks in them. And I had one guy who would hold his rod over his shoulder and the, the lure was about that far be below it. And he would do the old turn and talk to his buddy and turn over here and talk to his buddy. And that thing's going everywhere. That, that plug is flying everybody and everybody's ducking. I'm thinking this is not going to be good. So one, we're out there. We're only out there. I don't know, half hour or something. We're throwing top water down by Rio Vista. And I'm sitting there watching everybody's plugs coming in. And I see one guy, the, the, the crazy guy, and he just comes to a dead stop. Well, he was, God, I can still hear the sound. He hits his buddy in the side of the head with one of these four or five odd trebles. And that thing must have traveled about that far laterally across his scalp before it came to a stop. And this thing was buried past the bend. I mean, it was way in there. And so the guy's going, oh, a little, little help. <laughs> so I go over. And I go, well, you want the good news or the bad news first? And he goes, oh, you mean, he could just see his shoulder slump. There's more bad news than this right here. And I said, yeah. Um, the bad news is, is I take the stock trebles off of these things that come on the plugs because they're usually pretty thin and cheesy. And I replace them with these super strong death hooks, you know, chemically sharpened. And he, you could just see him go, oh, no. And <laughs> And I said, but the good news is, is they're barbless. And I just went, bloop. And well, aside from a little blood and hair on the hook, we uh, we kept fishing that day. And uh, that's really the main reason is a, a human safety thing. If you lose a striper, generally it's not that big a deal. I did lose one once years ago on the feather. Uh, Steve Ryan, I believe that was you out there if you're listening. Uh, that was probably 25 pounds. Uh, nice fish that came off. I mean, who knows if it was because of the barbed hooks or barbless hooks, but it did come off and the barbless hooks were blamed and I was blamed, of course. So um, anyway, uh, other than that, though, most of the time the, the barbless hooks don't really cause any trouble. And they certainly are way nicer when you're pulling them out of uh, human flesh. And and we get into a hot bite. I don't want to be messing with with uh, trying to dig trebles out of a uh, fish either. And I don't I don't like leaving a trail of floating corpses behind us if we're getting in a hot bite and we're just getting them all swallowed and I'm throwing them over the side and leaving them bleeding. So the barbless thing really does come in handy. So the one other thing, I know this is tip of the day, but I'll give you three. When you're rigging these things, and, and I'm sure Tom and I will get into all this rigging in depth as we go on uh, this evening, but um, you can see here, Couple things to note. First off, I'm using braid, and with top water, you don't need any other leaders. Just run braid straight to the plug. The fish are looking up. It's looking at this commotion. There's nothing to see as far as the line goes, so you're not going to spook them. You could have chartreuse braid for all I care, right down to your your plug, and it's not going to hurt anything. And then the other thing to note is the loop knot that's on the plug. And if you Google, well, there's all kinds of them. The Rapala knot. That's the tarpon loop that I do right there. Um, just, just get online and Google loop knot for plugs and uh, try it out. And what that does is instead of cinching the knot down to the eye of the hook, what you've got is some play there. So that plug has a little better ability to move back and forth. So you just get more action out of it. And uh, so that's that's just a little kind of uh, mini tip there. I, it's, it's not going to greatly increase your, your catch or or slow your catch down by any means, but all these things, when you start putting them together, you, know, you start adding little bits here and here and here, and eventually you've uh, got something pretty good uh, as far as being able to increase your chances of catching fish. So there is your tip of the week. <laughs> so again, sponsored by Not A Soul. So if you want to sponsor, you know who to talk to. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get to our guest, Mr. Tom Amberson of HK Slays Media. And there he is. what's up, dude? How you doing? Most quarantine yeah. like all of us. Yeah, so happy uh, to be here. Really happy to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. Uh, yeah. 
So my big trick today was I got a haircut for the first time in a month or two or yeah. whatever. Nice. Uh, my Clean. wife. How's your hair been doing? Uh, you, you my know, hair. I mean, I don't know if you can. You look pretty trimmed. Like it's not. I got a little. I got a little gel in it tonight. You know. So ah, there you go. I call my 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 professional professional look. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. So, yeah, I wanted it to look good for you. Okay. Well, you do, man. You're looking <laughs> looking suave. Um, yeah. By the way, great tips. Excellent tips. Oh, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm scared. I'm hyper. We'll get, we'll get into it because yeah. I know you're a you're a junkie like me. You're a top water fool. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Personally, uh, especially when I get into it, and and I haven't really had an opportunity to do it because I've been you know stuck at home, obviously. But yeah. um, when I get into top water fishing. It's like I don't care what it is. I just want to catch it on the surface. I don't even have to catch it. I just want to see the blow up. Like my buddy and I would talk about how it's a, yeah. it's like a spectator sport. Like you know, you get to watch two or three lures all at once. You don't care who gets blown up on. You just want to see a. See uh, that, a that's a great way to put it. Spectator sport. You yeah. know, when I think about um, why I am such a junkie, I, I think the it's kind of twofold in that one, you're casting, you're involved. Yep using the rod, walking the dog, whatever, keeping your eye on your bait. It, there's a, I don't want to say a higher level of attention, but um, for topwater fishing, you're kind of forced to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. For those swirls and blobs. And that that's the other thing too, the, the optics of it all. Right. You know, I mean, it could, uh, you know, uh, be frustrating at times, as you know, especially with these striper, mm -hmm. swirl mm -hmm. and swat and do all that stuff. And yep. Way to the boat sometimes, right? And uh, but that's how to hit the boat exactly. <laughs> exactly. The water. Yeah, so. that, that's but that's kind of the appeal to me is that it's really involved in, as you put it, a, a real spectator sport. Um, yeah, on that note, a serious question. Um, yeah. why is it more fun when, like, you and a buddy, like you and I, are fishing, you yeah. know, in your boat? I, I always watch the other guy's plug. I don't know why that is. It's like uh, there's something about somebody else's plug that's more intriguing to me than my own. Well, it's a hard habit to break, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, especially when, you know, you're watching someone else's bait and your bait's getting boiled on a little bit. Right. You know, that's a little frustrating. But, I don't know, again, it's a spectator sport. And, and uh, you know, um, I'm always interested in other people's style and cadence. You know, my uh, – people i fish with my friends we all have kind of a a different approach to it you know sure. and sure. Uh, you know i think it's it really is one of those things where you know i don't even think mastery is you know achievable with this because there's you know as you said putting little pieces together uh, an evolution with this you know yep. walking the dog different kinds of baits slow fast all the variations right. um, to me that's what makes it really appealing and but but the the visual the optics is you know ah, it's hard to beat and um, yeah exactly so i have uh let's just and, and you fish panama mm. for tuna and i'm sure you catch other stuff on the surface yeah. down there yeah it's drivers here in the delta top water yeah. bass i mean there's there's all kinds of stuff so i uh i got a few just a little visual uh inspirations here and so this first one is you catching a striper on the delta just okay i gotta watch some boils so oh yeah, yeah. We, we, we actually um you know that's the hardest thing about shooting fishing videos is so, you know to get the goods you gotta have a camera in your hand right and i was yeah. that means your rod's not in your hand <laughs> yeah i bring my wife and my friends fishing i always feel bad to ask them you know to hey you know especially if we know there's fish around but this day this video Happened. Everything worked out pretty good. Um, where we got the blow up and not a giant fish, but that you know, doesn't matter. Fish. And, and it's the the fact that you know that that's what people don't know is you know you're out filming and Michelle is uh, obviously the star of the show most of the time uh, for for good yes. reason. Um, she's yeah. she's a lot cuter than you are. <laughs> and uh, but oh, uh, yes, it's true. But uh, um, but. It, it, the fact that you actually got caught on camera here, uh, if people knew how many days and hours and weeks that went by where you weren't, yeah. even, I mean, you were there, you know, holding the thing, not right. So let's give you a little, a uh, little shot of glory here. Okay. And, and, yeah. and this one, people uh, will notice at the end, the fish comes up foul hooked, which is not uncommon with uh, boiling stripers. No, not at all. 
they seem to almost have terrible eyesight and they miss well, you know what what amazed me was you know it was skin hooked right between the two dorsal spines and maybe i didn't know how tough that skin was you know yeah that was pretty hard yeah it was a little i was pretty amazed to see that it held and it it, did. yeah so all right let's take a look at that here's So uh, that that was a cool one because that one yeah. didn't look like he followed a whole lot. He just kind of, you know, sometimes you get those ones that come all the way to the boat and don't commit. That one just boom. Right. He, he was on it quickly, and that's the way we like him, right? Not fair and just a solid stick. I mean, you, you probably know as well as I do that you can feel how good that fish is hooked, right? It just feels, yeah. oh, God, don't come on. You know, come on. But then I saw that I was skinned it, and I was like, God, I would have pulled half as hard had I known. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so okay now let's take it up a notch here this uh this one gets me pumped up this is michelle uh, uh down yeah. in Panama, i assume and uh just yeah. just watch the boil here folks i mean e even the i mean you don't even need to get a bite here to uh really enjoy right. this i mean the bite you know doesn't hurt but uh, so yeah. so check this out <laughs> Hurry, hurry, hurry. Just in there, just in there. Okay, keep that in there. I got that. I got that. Nice. I got that. <laughs> yeah, I was so I was so stoked to, to have gotten that on film. You know. Oh yeah, that. I mean, just watching that gets my heart pumping. Oh, yeah. and, then, and then that's pretty light gear. That's like you know bass yeah. gear. That's a, <laughs> that's a that's a Tranks five hundred with uh, I think that one's got fifty pound. Yeah. Oh. But a lot how, of how big was that fish? Oh, that one was probably 60, maybe 60, 70. See, I don't I don't really have Perfect a proper size. We don't like them too big down there. Okay. Well, that's what I was gonna say, yeah. It's and, and it's no fun. <laughs> I, yeah, pulling on one of those cows. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, guess don't knock it till you try it, but that to well, me even, even with the right gear, the, you know, there's something about those tropical tuna. The water's 90 degrees, they're just strong and mean and to the to the better end kind of thing. You know? Yeah, it just it seems like a herniated disc. It's screams <laughs> yeah. to me. Well, I'll tell you, there's especially 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 when we're throwing the popping gear, uh, you can't really use the harness. You know, we can use the gimbal play, but, you know, yeah. the harness is what provides the real relief and lifting power, you know, for those bigger fish. So, yeah, my back last year, at the end of day one, I was like, my God, my back is already. How many, how many more days do I have to do this? Exactly. And, man, it's, it's tough. Yeah, well, it's it's well worth it. Well, uh, yeah, well, not to mention what you get at the uh, the other end of it if you eat them. So oh, yeah. okay, before we get into talking all the nuts and bolts of top water, I wanted to show people um, a little top water thing that I do every year in Alaska. Oh, sweet. That um, isn't uh, it usually blows people's minds when I tell them that we catch salmon on top. So. Here's a, here's a little look at that, and, and if this doesn't get your juices flowing, uh, nothing will. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Oh yeah. There he is. Oh nice. Get that one? No. Oh he comes again. Here he comes again. <laughs> oh man. He wants it bad. Oh there's one behind the second one too. Look at that. Oh we got that one. We got that one. <laughs> That's awesome. Woo. Pop it down. Oh, there he is, there he is, he's coming, he's coming. Yeah! yeah. That's fun, fun, fun. <laughs> Top water coho. Very nice. From camera. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, there he is. Wow. Did you get him? <laughs> there he goes. There he goes. He's coming. Here he comes. Oh, that one turned away. Ah, that was okay, I could awesome. watch that. I could watch that for days too. How and, long was that, man? How how deep are you guys fishing there? Uh, no deeper than about six feet. Oh, perfect. And uh, people always ask, I, Sam, I, you know, it's like, well, it's a special case. It's it's uh, fresh coho. Um, I've caught pinks and chums on top too. I've had a a few king come up and swirl on topwater stuff, mm -hmm. and I've had them eat my bobbers, but I never actually, you know, fished for them and caught them. Yeah. But uh, those silvers, if they're down low in the system, are, are real aggressive sometimes. And uh, so, uh, before we get into everything else, I, there's people have always asked me, "What do you use?" And you can see it there, just kind of at the end of the clip. I just mm -hmm. buy these Rebel Pop Rs, which are pretty cheap, really. And uh, this you can tell they've been chewed to death. I buy the white ones. There's not a lot of bass plugs that come in a pink or whitey kind of color. You know, they're frog or craw or something. So that's how I first found these was just, hey, there's a white popper. And I take the trebles off and put just a single sidewash barbless on there. And uh, it's it's pretty fun. I've tried spooks and all that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. You know, up there, we're catching 100 to 200 uh, coho a day per boat. And... Um, that's two guys fishing. So and, is, is that something that that uh, other people do, or is this something you brought up there to try out and work out? Um, you know, the the pink wog, which is a, a, a deer hair popper on the fly rod, has been a thing for coho for years. And so I just, uh -huh. I certainly didn't come up with it, but um, I, I definitely uh, uh, improved on it, let's just yeah. say. So, so that, that's, a, that's the first time I've ever seen uh, top water for salmon. Yeah, isn't that cool? That's so um, we got a few questions and comments here. Before we get going too far, let's see if we can catch up on these. Uh, Jody Stover says, oh, I, I like the Wednesday show. Cool. Thanks, Jody. Uh, here's a striped bass question for us. James Kramer, do you have to use a wire leader for striped bass? Not at all, James. Not good at all. Great, buddy. Uh, they don't have – they have kind of sandpapery teeth. Yeah, yeah. Anything, uh, Brian Ricucci, uh, hula poppers, <laughs> uh, hula popper, awesome bait, old yeah. stuff. Bait. It, it would work, it would totally yeah. work, just nobody uses them, you know, for stripers for whatever reason. But anyway, and then just a few other guys saying, Hey, what's up? And so, uh, uh -huh. that's cool. Okay, so top water stripers, and you can see we've got the delta behind me because mm. that's where I like to be this hour of the day. Mm. Oh yes, you know here that magic yeah. hour when you wish you could just like press pause on the clock. Like okay, from yeah. here till dark, let's just slow it down, baby. That's right. It's all killing time till that prime time. Right. That's <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's why I like to launch in the afternoon. Yeah, fish towards the best time instead of yep. you know in the morning. If you don't get bit early on, you're like, uh oh, unless it's a cloudy day or something. But if it's a right. sunny day, you start going. We're fishing away from the good time, not the, you know. The, exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. Um, 
going, you know, I get a lot of questions. People go, the Delta, for example, is just a massive body of water. And how do you find stripers? So what I usually show them is talk about flats. And I'm yes. sure you agree to this. Um, stripers inherently don't like shallow water. But that's shallow water is where you got to go if you're going to throw a surface. You're not going to throw a surface bait in 30 feet of water, typically. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I've caught I've got topwater stripers in about 12 feet of water, but the water's got to be real clear and they got to be motivated. And um, so this diagram kind of shows what's going on. So you have these things, they, they typically live on these channel edges and they breaks and they feel a little more secure down there. The, the sea lions and whatever they're worried about uh, have a tougher time finding them out there in the deeper water, but they, they find most of their food up in those shallow weedy flats that are, you know, one to say eight or seven feet deep, something like that. Yeah. And so that's, that's, and I imagine this is kind of the same thing you're looking for, these these shallow flats. It, it absolutely is. I mean, I uh, in general, I say if I'm fishing six feet of water, it's three feet too deep already. I, I prefer to fish the shallow water. And this graphic basically says it all. And, you know, my thinking is if if there's fish up there, they're they're positive. They're good to go. They're they're looking. They're searching. They want to eat. So, right. um, you know, just try to take make it all line up with the low light, as you suggested, the prime time, uh, this, this transitionary deep to shallow, that's something I'm always looking for too. Um, yeah. fish edges, uh, island points, things of that nature. You know, I think, I think as you, as you put it, they do quick raids, they come and go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you'll make one drift through there, get a few bites, uh, you know, try again, maybe not so good, but come back later. They're, they're there again, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, it's 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 a shallow water game for me always. Right. And and the other thing that I, I wanted to point out with this is um, I typically catch my biggest stripers of the year fishing the surface. And yeah. it's kind of counterintuitive initially. You go, well, what? why why are the big fish up shallow? Why wouldn't they be out in the deep? Well, the way I see it is, out in the deep, you have the, you know, the balls of shad or whatever swimming around. And if you're a 20 pound striper, you don't want to spend the energy chasing around a four inch bait fish. You know, yeah. the, the protein gain for the energy expended ratio just doesn't work. So that's why these big fish come into the shell. I mean, small fish obviously uh, feed in the shallows too, but the big fish go in there because you have like this thing suggests bluegill, crappie, panfish, yeah. small bass. Small fish, small yes. fish. And, and that's that's typically where the, the bigger feed is. So I think that's why I end up catching a lot of my big fish of the year on the surface. Yep. So, um, anyway, that's that kind of gives you a visual on uh, what we're talking about. And then um, another thing people always ask about uh, is tides. And, and what I tell them is because, you go, know, what's the best tide? So well, what spot are you talking about? Right. Yeah, Exactly. The best tide is one that's moving, first of all. Yeah. Uh, slack tide is what we call the sandwich tide or the get yeah. get out of there tide. Sandwich tide, yeah. And it's funny because I don't think necessarily, uh, and, and see see if you agree with this or not, mm. I, I don't think it's that stripers or largemouth or whatever stop biting on that tide. I think it's just, I think of the way I see it in my head is a place like the Delta, it, when, it, when the tide's moving, doesn't matter which way, it's the bait fish gets you know, they get pushed into predictable areas onto a point or into the bushes. They don't want to be out in that main flow. They, they hunker down where the, the velocity is lower. That's right. And then when the, the slack, the tide slacks out, you have a giant thousand mile long lake Yeah. and then the bait can be willy nilly anywhere. And so, and, and maybe they do, do stop feeding, but you know, one time, uh, Randy Pringle, uh, he, he told me, one, instructor. yes, uh, he told me, uh, well, you know, nobody wants to eat a cheeseburger on a treadmill. <laughs> that's a pretty good analogy yeah and i agree yeah. with you you know they're you know like a lot of these predators ambush style predators you know if they're hanging out on the river's edge is where i focus my fishing basically is mm -hmm. river's edge shoals yep. uh, other deep to shallow kind of spots uh -huh. but my my saying is no current no confidence you know my own anecdotes anyways would suggest that the best bites come when we have current flowing and as far as 
the best tide, it really is it is relative to the spot, right? I mean, you know, some some spots are bite only on the outgoing, other spots bite on both sides of the tide. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter, I think, of and this and this to me again is a big part of the appeal um, is just trying to figure it all out. Yeah, right? and part that take that'll take a lifetime or a yeah. I've got fifteen what I would consider a full time effort, fifteen years on the Delta. Mm -hmm anywhere else really other than you know the saltwater stuff but you know i feel like i just put it, just scratched the surface you know i got this one zone kind of the the west delta you know broad slough rio vista to the upper san joaquin you know that kind of general areas where i fish and i feel like i could still put another 10 years in out there and not fish at all or or come close to cracking the code right it's just yeah i mean yeah. Every day I try to um, stop and fish a spot I haven't, and, and maybe just for five minutes. I mean, I don't, yeah. when I got paying guys in the boat, I'm not going to uh, stick them on a spot too long uh, that I don't know. But what I tell them is like, guys, hey, okay, this is this is your five minutes of you paying it forward to the next guy, which sure. the guy behind you did this too, yeah. and <laughs> find new spots. And yeah. we're not going to, don't worry, we're not going to hang around long if there's nothing here. Um, and that's the one thing, though, I do tell people when they ask, you know, hey, uh, about spots is, you know, if you if you got a spot that has kind of like the, all the things that look right, that it's got, right. the, oh, it's, got the speed, it's got the flat and it doesn't fish when you tried it, come back on the other time. Right. Don't right. give up on it. If it looks right, it might be. I mean, some it's spots you don't fish for whatever reason that, that yeah. we, we have no idea, but. Some of them are very, uh, very tide centric and, and the other tide for whatever reason. I mean, some of it's obvious, right? So one of the spots I like to jig in the San Joaquin, the, uh, the current's going this way on the incoming and there's a big drop off and those fish lay right behind that drop. Well, when the tide's going out, it goes, you know, it's the opposite and doesn't fish. And then some of them, you know, the current pushes right up against the Thule line or a point or something. You can see like, it's pretty obvious. Okay. The bait's going to yeah. get up there. But yeah. some of them, as you well know, um, like I don't know why I can't catch them here on the outgo. You know, well, like you're right, but it's not. Well, it's a, to me, it's always how it, whatever your experiences are, build your confidence in those spots. And to your point, how many times have you slid into those first time spots and first or second cast catch a fish? Right. I mean, it's, you, it has all the elements that we look for. Might not bite today. But that, that's a good way to look at it. If it has all those features, it's a spot worth checking in. And for me, and you might have the same experience out there, spots that used to be reliable, that you could count on, just don't bite anymore. I don't. I haven't given up on the spots. I still slide in there, but you're almost forced to fish new water to, yeah. to just, uh, you know, add another spot in your, your circuit. Yeah. And it's so, weird. It's I. I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot of spots like that for me where we, we had a, a hole or a hole, you know, just a flat that we call the 90% hole. And, uh, and I haven't caught a fish there in five years now. Isn't it crazy? Like, how, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Spots but, used to be so reliable. I mean, you can, you can almost bank on them, right. But just don't seem to bite anymore, but it's also been such that, you know, some of these spots, especially out there on the sack side, for some reason, they, they just seem to go dormant for years. But then there'll be a, a snap in the fall or whatever, where those, those spots turn on for, you know. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So it, always worth trying. But to your point, I, I think you, you're you're forced to fish new water just to try to scratch them out, you know. Well, and that, that's, I guess, the upside to those spots dying out is, is yeah. You know, it's like, okay, Mr. Uh, in your own routine, time to step outside your comfort bubble and uh, yeah. go figure something out. And well, I mean, yeah. nowadays, there's a lot more pressure down there. So that has yeah, to absolutely. And the fisheries declining. I mean, the two combined is just, it's, yeah. I mean, I, I've literally seen, I always tell my friends, it seems when I, those first five years, I knew less, caught more. Yeah. Yeah. And now, yeah. you know, I know a lot more, have a lot more spots, but just those fish, and the quality of fish overall is not as available as it used to be. Yeah, the California Delta feels very unhealthy to me nowadays. Uh, it's, it's a sad thing because it, it kind of happened without me really. I mean, it was kind of a slow motion thing where 
you know, there back in the day, it doesn't seem that long ago. We'd go out and you know, you have a twenty-five to fifty fish day. wasn't yeah. wasn't that noteworthy. It was fairly common. I mean, it didn't happen right. every day. And now it's like you go out and you, hey, we scratched three or four, you know, bites. And and I mean, there's there's the good days sprinkled in, but yeah. it, it used to be the bad days were sprinkled in, and and now it's vice versa. And that's yeah, that, uh, I would agree with that. And you know, the, the whether it's you know the the late fall fishing or the the spring fishing, which are, you know, the two best times of the year yeah. spots that used to be turned on for weeks or months, even now seem to be like days. Right. And uh, again, the, the quality, um, you know, I mean, a 20 pound fish these days, you're pretty stoked. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. Right. That's a, that might be your best fish of the year. A 10 pound fish. I'm, I'm elated. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Even, yeah. Uh, well, before we get too depressed on the no, no, sorry, man. Sorry. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, let's talk about, uh, the actual baits that you like. Sure. To throw. Um, okay. Uh, uh, go well, ahead. Well, Top well, few or whatever. And then we were kind of logic behind. I, I, I kind of go through kicks, if you will, you know, like, uh, past, I don't know, six, eight months. It's been about the plastic baits really. And, um, uh, initially back here, uh, late summer in the fall, this was a bait that we're throwing quite a bit. This is a Berkeley mega dog. Oh, okay. Six inch bait. Okay. You got some singles on there. Those are those, uh, yeah, and I, you know, I have to credit you for the single hooks cause I remember a long time ago, um, it was either an article I read or something where you're talking about the single hooks and with the barbs bent back. I, I haven't gotten that quite that far as far as bending the barbs back, but I, I like the single hooks. Um, uh, definitely easier to get them out. Yeah, you know, that's ultimately that. That's part of the biggest feature is it's better. It's easier on the fish. Yeah. Okay? Yep. And I, you know, you could argue whether it's more effective. I think that as far as the the hooking capability and hooking rate, it's about the same. Yeah, I go back and forth every day. I might miss a few. You, you know, know, I still have baits with treble hooks on it too, but yeah. Um, yeah. but a bait that I'm throwing a lot, especially if I know there's a lot of active fish around, it just it's uh, you know a bunch of people on the boat. It's it has all uh, nice features. Okay, and it, give, it, it, give it a little shake for me. Okay, so it has a little bit it's smaller got, rattles. Maybe it's uh, got one big knocker and a bunch of littler ones. Yeah, okay, combination. But they, this bait was surprising. The action, uh, the, this bait walks the dog very easy, very little effort. And uh, um, the size, you know, six inch top water or plastic bait, yep. uh, that, that caught my eye along with the color. You know, they, you know they, they say when it comes to Delta Stripers, uh, you know, color doesn't matter unless, you know, just make sure it's white, right? Right, right. For that effect, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, yep. this bone, this off white color, um, the size, uh, just all proven. So picked it up. I think I got a Walmart even, you know, it's like a, I don't know, like a $12 bait. Oh, no kidding. That was going to be my question. What's that thing real retail? 12 for? bucks. Oh, you know, one of the, one of the other cool things about uh, the single hooks, you know, we're fishing tight to the toolies all the time. Yes. And now and then you get the cast jam back in there. This comes out of those toolies a lot. Um, well, if you go across the grain uh, with the toolie, you're never getting it out. Exactly. So that's, that's another cool feature. Um, I, I'm I'm pretty convinced on the single hooks. I do it with all the offshore poppers, the yeah. offshore topwater baits, but you know stripers in general, man. It's just uh, you know it's a can be a very frustrating thing. I don't care what kind of hooks you have on there. Sometimes they simply they let you know they're there, right? But they you know they won't commit. Right. So, um, you know, and the the thing you do with the two um, um, a split ring, it's a great idea because I believe. You know, we lose a lot of fish when we're fighting them because of those torques. The stripers turn this way, that way. And you're right. It really torques that hook mm -hmm. and, you know, feel them pop it out. Um, that's something I'm think, I think I'm going to check out. Um, yeah. What's nice about that as opposed to um, running a, like a swivel, a barrel yeah. swivel between them is I just think it's, it's uh, well, first of all, if you are having to take the treble off, put a swivel on there then you got to put another barrel swivel on and then put the treble back on the stuff's hanging down quite a ways and it's gonna maybe change the action of your bait um so it's just easier to slap that second uh where is it there second split ring yeah, yeah. And, um 
Um, and you still get pretty much 360 degrees worth of. That, that's what's key about that, I think, is that ability to, to be able to make those twists and turns. Yeah. You know, it's to a certain point and they're just going to pop out. You know, that I can sometimes I can feel, oh, there's one. You yeah. Know. Yeah, boink. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's oh, oh, no. pretty frustrating. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the other thing, uh, uh, split ring, especially if you buy good ones, it's yeah. real tough to open those up as far as, you know, if a, a fish right. is like a swivel, it's hard to break a barrel or a, a split ring. Yeah, so, this is something about those stripers and the way they pull, man, that really puts a lot of torque on split rings. You know, when I first started striper fishing, I was a troller. Okay. Yep. And you learn pretty quickly that, you know, it's a good idea to switch out those split rings and the hooks, especially right. if you upgrade the hooks. Now the split rings are the real uh, weak point, right? So, yeah. Yep. I believe in that. This is another one. Um, just started throwing this in earnest here in February, March. This is a Yozuri Hydro Pencil. He's a cute little fella. I like the big eyes on him. Yeah, dude, this is another bait that just, well, Michelle, this is now her favorite bait. She Last time we were out there, she just destroyed him on this bait, but they, they really like this one too. And it's a single knocker and it's not too, you know, yeah. uh, not as intrusive. Yeah, it's got it's a bit subtle and talk about uh, ease of walking the dog. Um, right. Yeah, and these you know with these plastic baits too, I tend to they seem to me to work better. You know, popping the rod tip up mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to like with these big wood baits we normally throw. Oh yeah, down and across. Down, yeah, yeah down. So um, um, it's it's interesting. Uh, like I, I've thrown some of these. I mean, they're beautiful handmade baits that these guys are making. Yeah. There's several. What is, that? is that a catch bait? Looks like yep. a catch. Yeah, yeah. And they they do a really pretty bait, and you don't have to. Actually, you do on the back. I don't have a double split ring on that one. I don't think I've used that one, but the the middle the middle one rotates, so you don't have to. Uh, yeah, do it. right. It's on the swivel. But the wire, yeah. Um, and then and this monstrosity. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I know this thing works because I've caught fish on it, but you uh, need rotator cuff surgery. After about half a day of throwing the thing. Well, that's the thing. How much, you know, how angry does your shoulder get with you? Right. Well, this uh, week, this one, I'm not getting any younger either. So. Yeah, to your point. Oh. Good Lord. What uh, is that? A nine inch. Okay. Oh, hang on. There we go. Nine inch. Um, I've caught one, two fish on this one. It was about a 14 pounder. And then, uh, amazingly enough, like a three or four pounder ate this bait too. Is that a wood bomber? What is yeah, that? This is a Delta wood bomber. Show yeah. Him that. yeah, there we go. Nice. I think this is, he calls this the uh, the Sinister B52 series, the big ones, nine inch. Bait. Goliath. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I probably got 20 casts and I'm over it. You know, what I yeah. mean? Older is just, you know, blown out. And you're not getting any younger. But the wood, the wood bait, you know, if, if I know there's good fish around or if I'm just compelled to force feed, these fish some topwater bait and I want to try for that one big bite, it's going to be a wood bait that I throw every time. Yeah. Just, you know, it's, uh, it's not so much that, uh, you know, I want to catch a fish, but I want to catch it my way and I want to maximize the experience out of that fishing and the, the big topwater plugs definitely help to, to make that a reality. You know, again, you know, typically it's either nothing, a swirl, maybe one or two blow ups, and if you stick one, I mean, that just makes your whole day. You know? Oh, yeah. That's that are better than others. But, you know, I'm always looking for a good bite. Yeah, the bite, the one. The one, exactly. A fish that's going to let me win Facebook for the day, basically. <laughs> yeah. the, competition, the competition is fierce. Okay? Yeah, that's that's a fact. Um, on, on the wood bait uh, topic, yeah. the, the guys that really swear by these, and, again, I – well, I, I you know I don't get to go fishing that much on my own, so uh, I don't use them that much because again <laughs> my shoulder starts getting sore. And I go to something lighter, and at fifty plus bucks a pop, it's hard to put them in the hands of uh, everybody on your boat. When I, I mean they're they're great, they work, but it's not like head and shoulders. Like I, I don't catch twenty more fish. Over. These baits actually work better. Okay, I, and I'm, I'm going to say that because if you if you judge working better by frequency of bites, 
And to me, the plastic baits will typically raise more fish and you'll just catch more fish. The, the bigger baits, uh, big wood baits, you know, again, you're looking for the one, but I, yeah. I, I would recommend any, a, a Zara spook can go out sure. there and catch fish as these, these more expensive baits, right? I mean, Zara spooks caught probably more stripers than any yeah. lure on the yeah. board. You know? And that pencil popper, that that redheaded pencil popper. Yeah, what I do with that? There he is. It probably killed more topwater striper than any bait out there. Okay. Right now, so the one thing that I think is important to mention to folks, um, the, like the cotton cordell pencil popper. You're right. That's a. I mean, that's as fishy as they come. Red right. and white. Who knows why that color? I mean, that's that's a color like our grandpas were using. Exactly. As we say, our grandpa fished that bait, right? Just it still works just as well. Um, and I've got a bunch of them because you don't lose top water plugs that often, right? I mean, they're not getting snagged. Oh, basically. I mean, you, right. I mean, yeah. you lose them on fish or, you know, in a, up in a tree or whatever, but it's hard know. not to lose them. That's for sure. Yeah. And, and I have a bunch that I have in my, you know, my guide box on the boat that barely have any paint left on them. Cause I've had them for years. And so, and we've got some big fish on them. Well, a buddy of mine, and, and you may know him, Greg McElroy, uh, he's he's a dude. Duck. I do know Greg Macker. He's the guy who turned me on to you, and I got to tell that story to you. As a matter of fact, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I hold on. Right. Um, yeah. He uh, he sent me a picture that was just like that. That was all that was left of it. He goes, dude, I had the biggest blow up of my life, and all that came back was this. <laughs> These, at least the Cotton Cordell model, bless their hearts don't have wire through construction right so yeah. a fish a big fish bit back here and broke it off and still oh. around with half a pencil popper now if you go with oh geez like, uh, the, i'm a big sticks yeah through wire through um i don't know about the berkeley one that you have there yeah, uh, this is a through wire and this ema this thing is actually saltwater grade okay well, i threw this bait for tuna out of the box nice nice yeah. okay. very high quality and cheap 15 bucks, 18 bucks. And then, and then the wood ones are all wire three, two. For yeah. Me. These are all through wire, you know, 300 pound triple coiled split rings, um, 200 pound mm -hmm. swivel, saltwater grade, saltwater grade. And that's a good thing to, for people to think about because um, it's worth, I mean, a, a cotton cordell pencil popper is like six bucks. So you can't beat the yeah. price, but if you, it's just that, that thought of God, what if today's the day that I hook, that 60 pounder and and do i want to have a plug that doesn't have wire through it right i mean it, it probably will hold but yeah, that's not kind of a lesson you want to learn right yeah so um hey before i forget um what uh what size of those owner single uh, hooks are you running on your plugs oh these um these are actually bmc inshores are like 2x um this one has these okay yeah, these are uh, three aught on this one, and I do believe that these are yep same size three O's. Okay. Okay, and I also like on the big. I have some uh, the the bigger six and eight inch baits. Uh, like that's a five O. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I go on the front, and then I got a three O in the back. But you know, I I try to match them up as best I can. But sometimes it's just you know what I have laying around. And <laughs> A little too small or a little too big, but those striper don't seem to care too much. No, the, the only thing you got to watch out for, as you know, is you can, if you put too big a hook on a lure, it can you know, make it not float or, or change the action. So, right. right. Um, what I do, and I'm terrible at remembering hook sizes. Hey, what size hooks do you put on your, you know, quick fish or whatever? I'm like, I go to the shop and I go, I hold the, up, uh, the package of hooks up to the one on the wall. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the okay, got it. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I think eyeballing it's you know always going to work out, right? I mean that's yeah. yeah, I don't you know whatever I have laying around kind of thing. So we're getting a, a little message from the North Coast. Captain Jim Mitchell says uh, definitely swivel. Oh yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. He's uh, he's agreeing with the swivel program. Yeah. Yep. Uh, um, uh, split ring swivel, whatever. Uh, both work. Um, okay, so now, oh, well, go ahead and tell me the uh, McElroy story. Well, so, so I don't know if you remember this, okay, but you know, way back in the day, and I say way back, and it's like two thousand five, six, seven, that time, that era. There used to be this uh, internet fishing club I was a part of called Outcast Anglers, and Greg was a member of that um, of that internet fishing club, and mm -hmm. I 
fully admired this guy. I mean, he was fishy, he, dude. Oh my oh, god, dude, he's a hell of an angler. And going out there and getting the big topwater stripers and stuff like that, um, really, and to this day, admire Greg a lot. But he, it was some one time we were talking about guides or something like that, and he says, "JD Richie, you know who JD is." I'm like, uh, "I've heard of him." He's like, "You have to check him out." Yeah, JD is the real deal. And I said, "Oh, okay, cool." So I think maybe that year or the year after it was at the Sportsman's Expo, I came up to you. Okay, I don't, you probably don't remember. It was a long time ago. And we were talking, and I, I looked at it, and I go, you know what? You are the real deal, aren't you? I don't remember that, but that's, you know, based on what Greg told me, you know, I, I remember having conversations with Greg, going, yeah, man, JD, that dude's awesome, man. He's just, you know, yeah, cool. to you and just, you know, the way you answer my questions. And, you know, when a, uh, another angler is, you know, you just know if they're legit or not, I guess. That's Blowing what you off or whatever, yeah. Yeah, but you know, they walk the walk and talk the talk. Isn't yeah, that? well, that's cool. I appreciate that. Um, Greg, the first time I met him was, um, as if anybody watching cares, but uh, it was a funny story. Uh, well, if you, Greg, they would care, okay? That's right. Um, uh, he, um, uh, I didn't know him. He was, uh, he ran into a buddy of mine, one of my good fishing buddies, Tim Riley, um, somewhere on the river, and and, and Greg was going. I know you from somewhere. And, and Tim's like, uh, I don't think so. And, and, and he goes, Oh, you're from JD's site. He goes, Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's a buddy of mine. And Oh, wow. Cool. And so Riley was telling me the story about how he met this kid he called super fan. And, uh, and uh, I said, he and I were, I don't know what they exchanged numbers or something. And, and Tim and I were going uh, shad fishing by my house when I lived down there on the American one evening, I said, Hey, you gotta call that kid. And uh, just invite him out with us. And, and mm -hmm. so that's how we met Greg. And I've yeah. uh, been friends ever since. And he's always an awesome dude. dude. I, I, I've fished with him a couple of times and, and just enjoyed fishing with him. Sturgeon Slayer. This guy just destroyed. Oh, oh yeah. He's, he's a yeah. beast. Okay. One more question before we yeah. keep moving on here. Do you sense on top of our I don't use sense for anything stripe rather than if you're using, you know, Cut bait. I use I use scents on the swim baits for sure, and I am a 100% believer in it. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten first cast fish after reapplying. Mm -hmm. and diaper, yeah. Well, with top to answer the question, top water baits, no, because one time I did got a bite, and when I grabbed the bait, it was so slick I hooked myself. <laughs> well, that's, that's, what I, that's what I think it would work because you know these fish are followers, right? Stripers, yeah. By nature, like to follow the bait. Now that's what I always envision in my mind with the swim bait. I'm just slow rolling it and they get behind it, follow it. And I think that scent will, you know, at times trigger that bite. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe yeah. with the drop water too, because you know, they follow those baits quite a bit too. Yeah. Honestly, I've never even water. thought about it on top water. It's kind of an interesting concept. Yeah. Um, for me, it's a safety issue. Okay. Yeah. But, it's a comfort zone for sure. Now, now the fear is there, JD. So <laughs> Now you got me thinking um, <laughs> because because I, I've I've tried uh, probably not enough um, mm. times you know you go with what you're comfortable with but yeah, I've had yeah. the same thought like why wouldn't adding scent to a swim bait it holds the scent pretty well why why wouldn't that help and I've just not seen like you have the mm. the increase and again you know you do what you're comfortable with and you don't yeah. you don't stick with it if you're not. So I'm sure. probably haven't given it enough time, but but you think about okay, the guys fishing at the Rio Vista Bridge, the guys fishing up the river, you know, uh, on anchor in muddy water are using yeah. the stripers are finding the bait with their nose. Yes, and so why why wouldn't you want to put you know just add an extra little bit of meal appeal? That Absolutely, makes I, I think it it does make a. Uh, 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 substantial difference here to my point all right in the winter time when the water's below 50, 48 degrees i'll take a swim and i use this uh the smelly jelly it's like a petroleum based yeah, yeah. Really thick, right like um, vaseline almost like vaseline exactly i will put so much of that on there the bait doesn't even swim okay <laughs> i'm just throwing it out there tail doesn't even move. i get bit okay it's like bait fishing in essence all yeah. right slow moving bait Exactly. So I, I am a firm, firm believer in scent for sure. Yeah. Well, that, that, was, that was a good question, Jim. That's yeah, a, excellent yeah. question. Um, and, and, and let me and, clarify something. Can I clarify something? Yeah, please. Uh, you know, I'll stick by my words that these plastic baits, 
they're, they work better in that I think you, you know, especially if you're a novice, okay, you're going to get way more action, hence your interest level will raise and hopefully yeah. to the point where you will invest that 50 to 100 bucks. Yeah. What I would call a boutique bait, okay? <laughs> yeah. These are on another level. You fish them differently. Everything's, well, the way I fish, it's slowed down. It's just a more involved process. Mm -hmm. that, that, that in itself enhances the topwater experience. Sure. You know, the bites that you get on these big baits, you know, not to mention the swirls, you know, you know, they're 20 pound plus fish. You can just tell by the size of the swirl. Right. To me, again, it's that experience. I don't want to say I don't care if I don't hook them, but if I see some fish on a given day, I can come back for them later. And in, in essence, that's what keeps me coming back for more is those fish, those swirls, those lost fish just keep swimming around in the back of my head. Yeah. yeah. A big topwater bait and try to, you know, to me, it's the utmost in fish bakery, I guess you can say. You're just right. faking them out with that. And it's kind of a, you know, it's just a, at a higher order, I guess you could say. It's uh, it's I like the distinction between the two. It's mainlining adrenaline is what it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's everything's big and gnarlier and, and just, uh, again, a little bit more involved process, a little bit more technique centric, I guess you can say, or trying to take it to that level where you get those these wood baits i think one of the biggest attributes they have is the, the lateral glide i mean you work them right into the conditions the current uh, the direction of your drift wind chop if it's all working out these baits can go you know 18 inches this way 20 inches that way huge just lateral glides does that get bit more is a question i don't know i mean sometimes i think i'm only impressing myself by doing that because <laughs> you know, I've had many many first timers just straight pulling it catch 20 pounders so you know but if you can't impress yourself who do you impress so. <laughs> exactly but you know that, I'm, when i talk about the involved aspect i'm trying to maximize trying to maximize the action of the bait i guess yeah. you, is is you know what i what i consider fun and um uh, makes it appealing yeah i mean that's kind of the cool thing is that uh, just with stripers in general is you you can catch them a hundred different ways. I mean, whatever yeah. you're into, uh, you can catch them. Now, the coolest part I think about uh, about the topwater thing is is the bite and the blow up. And oh, absolutely, well, as it's we, everything, it's yeah, everything. As we saw in the video of the fish you caught, and actually some of those salmon too, there was a lot of follow. -up. Yes, and and what what I tell people when they get on my boat is. Um, you know, don't expect uh, a fish to necessarily just annihilate it like that one did. Usually you're going to get a lot. Typically what I, what I see or what I, what I envision a, a typical striper bite is, or a topwater um, connection or uh, whatever you want to call it. It's not always a bite, but um, you get a, a push, a boil of, of water behind your bait. And you're like, whoa. Yeah. And it's funny. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the clients don't see it. I'm just so into it. Right. Here he comes, here he comes. And I think half the time they, they think I'm lying, like just yeah. to get them fired up. <laughs> oh, we got one right behind you. Oh, keep coming, keep coming. And so yeah. my question to you is, um, and there's a lot of different trains of thought, and I'll give you a mic after. So okay. you're, you're working a bait, and just say you're, you're uh, walking the dog, and you're getting yeah. close. And you know what I'm talking about here. You're getting close to the boat, and you're like, Running out of time, running out of time. Oh God, come on! And and so, when you get a swirl, do you think? Because because Greg McElroy, the guy we were just talking about, he's all about pausing. About what? Pausing the bait. Ah, like, okay. Yeah. He, he maintains that he gets bit a lot when he stops it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I well, go ahead and, and well, tell me what your thought. And, and there's no. No rule here, obviously. Of course, you know, for, for me, um, it, in a word, it would be composure, and by that I mean, you know, what I what I would tell people to do, or how I instruct people is, you know, you got to watch the bait, you know, for all the reasons we just talked about, and um, if a fish swirls on your bait, but the rod doesn't load up, keep doing whatever it is you're doing to raise that fish. Mm -hmm. uh, composure is the word I, I use. Yeah, I like it. You know, don't speed it up. Don't slow it down. Keep doing whatever it is you are doing to raise that fish. They will likely come back. Now that said, d these fish bite on the pause a lot. Okay, I don't. I don't intentionally. Oh, I will pause the bait, especially as the water cools. Slow everything down. Yep. Pause it on occasion. 
And typically on that, what's interesting to me is I'll let it pause even up to three, four, five seconds. And that initial pop coming out of that pause, boom, that's when they, they're just sitting there looking at it mm -hmm. or so it appears. Okay. Right. But generally, and, and speaking in the general terms, it, to me, it, like you, it's about getting, you get the blow ups when the bait's moving. Right. And um, if you run out of room, fire it back out there, especially if they didn't feel the sting of the hook, that fish can come back. Yep. Um, or if someone else is at the ready to fire off their top water bait or, you know, something like these, these flukes. I love these baits too. Um, um, you know, but that, again, that to me, that's the frustration is part of the fun. I know that sounds kind of odd, but it, it, that to me is, it brings a lot of fun and excitement to the game. Um, well, striper fishing is a little masochistic to begin with. It, it is. It is. <laughs> but yeah, I totally agree, man. It's, um, but that to me is the allure of it, but composure in a word is, is what I would. Uh, yeah. I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow that. Uh, you can feel free. I, I usually yeah. say, you know try not to panic, but composure yeah. sounds a little cooler. <laughs> and and it's yeah. interesting because you'll you'll get that push of water, and then you keep popping. Yeah. And it's like you know just keep working it. Keep these yeah. coming, he's coming. Keep and yeah. doing what doing what you're doing to raise them, like you said. And uh, the the other thing I I tell people is, okay, when you get bit. These things have, I don't know if it's just terrible eyesight or what. You get a, it's like somebody dropped so a ball out of an airplane on your yeah. bait, and he doesn't even doesn't even have it in his. He didn't even touch it. You know, he just yeah. next to it. And so I, I tell people, imagine that scene in Star Wars, right, where uh, the original Star Wars, where Luke puts on the helmet and he has to like fend off the little laser thing. He's doing a little Jedi practice thing where he can't see. He has to use the Force, like. Yeah. Don't trust your eyes. Don't trust your ears. <laughs> because nice. you're going to see a splash. You're going to hear a splash. Yeah. And yeah. unless you, you got to trust your arm. If your arm straightens out. Yes. He's got it. Go ahead and let him take right. it. Back. And you, you lift up and you got yeah. him. Yeah. Whatever you do. But if you just go on sight and, and hearing, uh, you're going to miss a bunch of them because I mean, well, and, and you're going to pull it away. You're going to pull it away from them. That's why I see it. A lot of people do. They get a blow up and they immediately <laughs> go for the Hollywood hook set, right? Yeah, the two hand. You know, these, these, these fish have to load up, right? right. Have, to have the bait in their mouth. I've had, especially these big baits, they'll have it in their mouth, but they'll have it like this. The hook's not even in their mouth and they're swimming away with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Like that, you know. I'll ask people, have you ever dry fly fish for trout? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, you let them grab it and then you go down and then you yeah. start. So the yeah. same thing, just, you know, again, wait till your arm yeah. straightens out. Don't trust these. Uh, it, it's a bit of a learned thing, I would say. You know, it takes a few wins and losses to really grasp that concept. Yeah. Um, but we typically learn that lesson the hard way, do we not? Yeah. Well, that's, again, part of the fun. And yeah, you, absolutely. you mentioned it uh, just a minute ago. Uh, you kind of beat me to the punch. Mm -hmm. So if you've got one that maybe even two or three casts in a row – swirls and doesn't mm. uh, doesn't go the old sluggo uh, yes you know same unwavering theory, same theory is the fluke it's basically the, the same bait fish yep. across the same way okay this is a, i use this as a top water bait jd yeah. oh yeah same here oh, this is bait top water yep yep and awesome yeah and you can make them weedless and yeah and, yeah uh, so you know you got i tell people that if you're going to do this you have to have this rod rigged ready to go, like unclipped from right. the keeper. This has to be within, you know, sit this rod down and grab this one because you don't have a real big window there. You got like three seconds while that fish is hot, right? Right, right. And But what, what I love about these things is, you know, if you're fish, fishing them weightless, you know, they kind of do this. You, I mean, a lot of times you throw that in, you don't even have to twitch it because he, right. and, and, you know, I always think in my head, like I, like I'm a, thinking like a fish which is dangerous because they have a brain you know about that big but right, right. the thought is okay there's something not right he was scared or, or whatever it was to not commit to the top but as soon as this thing comes floating down he's like "Ooh, i must have wounded it <laughs> you know exactly instinct they can't resist it yeah help themselves right when they're keyed up like that at that moment yeah, uh, yeah. i mean they're all yeah. lit up hot. Yeah. 
but yeah. there's something that just doesn't want to make them commit to that, you know, that extra. It's funny because, right. you know, as soon as the the sun, like if you fish in the morning and you yeah. get past the magic hour and the sun's coming up, I can catch a striper on a glide bait or a swim bait, you know, this far under the right. surface. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> like, but they're underneath the top water. <laughs> yeah. Hey, come on, man. It's it's just an extra couple inches. But yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I know that frustration too. For sure. For sure. We've caught them on top. You know, you have two on sunny days, but yeah. generally give me the, the cloudy, rainy. Oh, and it's, yes. That's those are the money days, in my opinion. All day long. Yeah. Water baits. Absolutely. The whole time, boys. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a certain. A certain type of cloud cover that I like. It's I, I, the words would be hard to come by, but it's a very pastelly, uh -huh. a soft but deep cloud cover. It's like a Monet painting or something. Exactly, exactly. You, I see it and I just know. Okay, these are the kind of days that these fish bite. Okay, yeah. um, and and what we should probably uh, note at least uh, and see if you're you're on the same page here. Uh, you can get them on top when there's some wind. But Absolutely, yeah. um, a, a ripping wind is, I think it's just too much commotion on the surface for them mm -hmm. to be able to really keen on your bait. It's not like they won't eat it, but, yeah. um, and I think also when it's really rough, they kind of vacate the shallows. It just, you know, they're all of a sudden they're on the surface then their belly hits the bottom and, you know, so yeah, uh, yeah. Rough days, that's, you know, not the, the optimum, but a little bit of chop on a cloudy day is money. I agree with that. Just enough to diffuse the surface, right? That's how that's how I always look at it. Um, yeah, that five to seven knots of wind. Uh -huh. Moreover, your drift and the current, everything's working perfectly together, right? And it matters because those components have an effect on the action of your bait. Right. You get them to work at their best. All these things ideally come together. Then you add time of day and you're just like, okay. It's the gonna time, right. I mean, it's <laughs> and then you sit there, you don't catch anything for two hours and you go exactly. But <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you know what? Uh, I, I'm always amazed. Uh, uh, you know, to your point about choppy conditions, I will agree that you know the the bites can diminish. Um, but I, there's been times where I'm amazed what these fish can see. Yeah, you know, I'd be fishing a you know a part of the bank where the water's pushing right up on it, so, and the wind's blowing right, so you got the wind chop. You have just, you know, the current and everything just kind of creating a, like an unstable surface, right? I'll throw it in there. And it, I mean, it looks yucky and those fish can still see it. Um, but uh, overall, yeah, I prefer the, just, just that right amount. Sure. The surface puts them off guard a little bit. Yeah. Right. Gives them a little, little broken surface, makes them feel at ease. Exactly. Yeah. I would fully agree with that. Uh, so, uh, we should ask uh, you guys watching on Facebook and uh, not Instagram. What's the other one? YouTube. Uh, so many social media platforms, so little time. Uh, if you guys have any top water questions, uh, feel free to type them in here while we're, we're uh, going along. And then um, if uh, uh, you are on YouTube, let's see if I can find this here. If you go to yeah. Tom's, HK Slay's YouTube page. Um, you have a really uh, in-depth, what is it, like 30 minutes almost, uh, top water video on there? Yes, and it's 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 my featured video on my page. It's uh, titled Delta Stripers 101, Top Water Tips and Techniques. It was just a, a, a fall day where Michelle so graciously offered to film all day. Wow. The action wasn't good, but the, the words flowed. So we got a pretty decent edit out of it. Um, I kind of... Did my best to go through all the different baits I throw, including um, this this fluke, which um, talk about again something you can work on forever. You know the ways you can fish this bait is really uh, infinite. Okay. Yep. Um, but so I go into that, talk about the the plastic, the wood baits, and some of the finer points with the the casting and things like that. It, it's uh, you know out of the, out of the uh, maybe I have fifty edits on there, and wow. by far, literally, you know, when I look at my analytics, that one is performing 1,999% better than all my other videos. So there must be something there. Yeah, you struck a struck a nerve, struck a chord. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, speaking of chords, uh, what, what, uh, what's your band's name? Oh, the band I was in uh, was the Knockoffs. Oh, the Knockoffs. Okay. Yeah, we were a 
2016 was uh, the last time I played with him, but I was in that band for 23 years. Oh, wow. And was a drummer and um, uh, played a lot around here, uh, West Coast tours, things like that. Uh, a great, great experience that, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget a lot of things we did in that band. Just a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, in the vein of uh, old school punk, like, you know, you'd met, we were talking earlier, you said, you you know, listen to The Clash and The Ramones and Sex yeah. and was, yeah. I love old school, you know, maybe because I'm old, but, oh, well. you know, <laughs> do, you still, do you still listen to The Ramones at all? Yeah, of course. Of I course. love them still, man. It's That's one band I can put on and just, one, two, three, both. Oh, no, 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 no. Exactly. Yeah. First course, first course, first course, done, right? I mean, you know, the the is a minute too long. <laughs> the simplest yeah. and the, the live. Simplicity. That's what I love about it. And that's the kind of music we did with a little bit of a um, a pop twist to it, you know? Right. Yeah. Pop, you told me. Punk, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, well, before I get too far off the uh, track here, we do have a question from Brian. What about nighttime topwater delta? What color do you suggest? Dark. Yeah, black. What a, I, I, I have uh, tried it, and and again, not a whole lot. Um, I've not done that well. I know people do. Um, mm. Drivers are very nocturnal. Yeah. Uh, and, and it may be just one of those things I just, you know, again, you got to. Yeah, you know. my experience has been like yours. I used to fish a lot at night um, early on down there um, out of the Port of, uh, Port of Stockton. Uh, I yeah. think it's called Atherton Cove. Yeah, There's some dock along there in that little cut where dock lights and the stripers, you know, would be hanging out on the edges. We didn't throw top water. I think we did, but not a whole lot of action on the top water, but like the, the rattle traps and the. Uh, the swim bait it's interesting you know you bring it through that spot of light and as soon as it got into the shadows boom, oh, yeah. boom. well in the most recent time i went and, and really uh went down the delta and, and hit it hard it was a fall evening that looked just like this one behind me yeah. just, and we had a great um you know last half hour bite mm. and, and and we picked this day because I've been guiding down there, and the weather, the the evening top water bite was great, and and I I had a day off the next day, and I called my buddies and I said, you know what, let's go. It's just gonna be like eighty degrees tomorrow night, or something. You know, the warm fall, and there's no wind. There's a full moon. You know, let's go just fish all night, and let's you know be cool. It's it badass out there on the full moons, man. I love. It. It was awesome, but we didn't catch squat until we got to some lights, like you said. Right. We the dock, and we threw some swim baits and kind of salvaged our night. Um, but uh, that was my kind of, eh, maybe this isn't for me. But plus, it's well, just family. And my, and my experiences have been the same, you know, and you might relate to this, but you're out there at prime time, that last half hour, wide open. But as soon as the sun goes down, it just shuts off, right? Yeah. yeah. And there's been a lot of that in my experiences. Uh, there was one time where um, my battery died in my truck. So my, my Michelle had to come down, pick up my buddy Nathan, went to go get another battery. I, I just put the boat back in the water and uh, uh, fishing in the dark. One huge blow up that I couldn't see, but definitely heard. Oh, wow. Yeah, but of course, I don't feel anything. Okay. I fish blew up on, didn't even touch the bait. Yep. Often goes, right? Right. I've had, I, I, my overall experience is haven't been good, but I, but I love being out there, um, especially as the moon is setting out toward the west, you know, maybe 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. It really lights up out there. I mean, it is gorgeous. And just, I, and, just that experience, I think. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You hear all the critters and it's absolutely, just, man. Really cool. It just, yeah. Like, the sounds carry, man. You hear the coyotes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's really bitching. And then, you know, as, a, as that sun starts coming, especially in the early spring, just a cacophony of wildlife, man. You know, wait, all the birds waking up, man. It's just, I love it. I yeah. love it. It's, it's, it's nature out there is really the appeal in part to me. Yeah, and and in the winter, all the the geese and waterfowl. Yeah, right. It's a neat place. For sure. I'm sad to yeah. see the. Uh, getting uh getting trashed like it is but uh yeah it's, it, it's tragic it is man it really sucks um all right well uh again folks if you want to go check out tommy's uh top water how-to video 
Yep. It's right there. You'll and I got tons of other stuff on there from uh uh you know uh five, six years of Panama fishing, some so SoCal offshore bluefin tuna fishing, uh, a bunch of striper stuff, link cod, rock fishing. Nice. And, oh, and uh, the latest edit was a, a carp, carp fishing here in our local neighborhood yeah. lakes. That's what we've been doing on lockdown. Yeah, that was fun. That was it fun. was fun, man. That fish was a toad, dude. I was like, oh shoot. Which reminds me, the guest for next week on Wednesday is tentatively John Sherman of Sims fame, who is going to uh, talk uh, fly fishing for the brown bonefish, the carp. Ah, nice. yeah, check it out. Delta rat. So uh, that should be cool. So that uh, he's got a Mexico trip planned, which may or may not happen. I assume it's not. Um, so I think he'll be on here. So stay tuned for that. And, uh, Ooh. Brother, it's been awesome. Thanks for coming yeah, on, JD. Let's, uh, let's, get, let's get out there soon when we can. Okay, I want to up and uh, um, see how you're doing it up there. Those fish are amazing. You're catching. Yeah, it's been fun, and we'll. Definitely- I think I, you know. I think right now you have the best fishery going in California. I know. Out of my little John boat, ten foot. Yeah. Uh, it's enjoy been- it, man. So, uh, yeah, we'll stay safe. Say hi to your bride, and uh, all right, we'll do. You too, man. We'll, we'll talk soon, and. Uh, um hopefully go fishing one of these days yeah so, soon sooner or right, later man okay. well thanks for coming on and we'll talk to you yeah. soon okay brother i uh, see ya so that's my man tom amberson a wealth of knowledge on the uh the top water scene there as you can tell and again check out his little thing and subscribe to his page and speaking of that come on over here and uh, subscribe if you like what we're doing here. That uh, makes us feel better, if nothing else. (laughs) So uh, anyway, again, remember Wednesdays, not Fridays anymore. We're going with Wednesdays uh, at 7 p.m. And we'll be doing it, uh, well, I don't know, until until you guys tell us uh, you're bored with it and we'll do something else. But uh, I sure appreciate you guys all tuning in. It's been nice having you. And thanks for the questions. And uh, Stay safe out there. It's, it's, you know, we're still doing this quarantine crud and uh, kind of over it myself, but uh, staying home and not guiding so I can uh, hopefully uh, flatten this curve and not have to, uh, you know, get this thing extended. So anyway, all right, everybody have a good, I was going to say weekend. That's because we're used to doing this Friday. Um, A good week until the weekend. Again, for me, not working. It's like Groundhog Day. I don't know what day it is half the time anyway, but I uh, sure appreciate you tuning in. And um, we will catch you uh, Wednesday. And uh, check this out. I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'm going to go out like a uh, like Captain Kirk here. So you guys all have a good week. We'll catch you later. Adios. Bye. <laughs>